Yeah, thanks, Terry. I'll go ahead and kick us off. We want to say thank you to everybody who's here today to join us for our November ACG Kentucky meeting. Um, excited to have John Stewart and the team at Middle Ground uh, here with us um, talking about uh, what they're doing here in the state and around. Um, as a quick intro, um, my, my name's Matt Berry and I'm with BKDCPA and, and Advisors and I'm also the president of our local chapter here. Um, one thing we, we want to start off is, is thanking our, our ch chapter sponsors, um, uh, both our, our annual sponsors as well as our corporate, our table sponsors. Uh, there's a lot of longtime companies here who have um, been involved with the chapter for many years and make the programming that, that uh, we do possible, uh, events like today. So I want to say thank you to all, all of our sponsors. And in the, in the same breath, I want to say thank you to all of our members as well. Um, and also those of you who are guests today and would be interested in, in chapter membership, uh, feel free to, to reach out to Terry or myself. We can provide some additional info. All right, at this point, I will uh, do our introduction to John. Uh, John Stewart is partner middle ground. He, he serves uh, for, uh, in the overall management of the firm and he also helps run the investment team with Warren Mulholland. Um, and, and has worked with on numerous transactions in, in numerous boards over the year. Um, so John, I'll, I'll turn things over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, no, so it's good, to, it's good to be here today and have this opportunity to, uh, to talk about, um, uh, uh, you know, my background. You know, it's, um, it's typical private equity, right? College dropout, hourly <laughs> line worker on a production floor. Uh, you know, becomes, uh, you know, the, the head of a PE firm, you know, not, not the typical story, but, you know, it's true. You know, I, um, I was in college uh, here in, in Kentucky uh, at Campbellsville College at the time before it was a university. Um, and uh, they were just starting a football program. And so I was over there uh, getting that uh, up and running uh, there too. And a bunch of my friends came to me and said, hey, you know, Toyota's come to town. Uh, this is back in, um, you know, 1988. And they said, uh, you know, Toyota's come to town. They're hiring people. Let's go and apply and get a job at Toyota. What a great opportunity. And so I did. I went and applied with uh, a bunch of my friends and, uh, you know, ended up being the, the only one that got an opportunity to go work at, at Toyota. And um, for some of the young people, you, you probably don't remember, but, you know, uh, Toyota is a you know, very important part of the state today. But it was, you know, at the time, it was like the, you know, really, really big news in the state of Kentucky. Uh, you know, people, you know, literally quit being doctors and dentists and everything to go out for an opportunity at, at Toyota. It was, um, it was, it was a really, um, you know, interesting time. And so I ended up joining Toyota on the night shift um, uh, uh, in uh, April of, of 1989 and uh, started there uh, building bumpers for the Toyota Camrys. Um, and, uh, you know, my parents weren't happy that i you know, decided to drop out of school to go do this. And, you know, I did it for the best reasons. You know, I wanted to get married, you know, at the young age of, you know, 20, uh, which was, you know, again, probably not, not the best decision in the world, but we've been married for 30 years. So I guess it's worked out okay. Um, and I hope she's not watching this. <laughs> That'd be like really <laughs> embarrassing. Uh, but, um, but anyway, so I, I uh, you know, went to work at Toyota and I, I really like the environment. You know, I think, you know, today, there's a lot of young people, you know, have grown up with a, um, you know, where, where they don't, they don't cut the grass at home and, you know, everything's done for them. And, you know, they, you know, if they probably cut the grass, if they could use their Xbox or, you know, their PlayStation to do it. But other than that, you probably can't even get them to go outside. And, you know, but I grew up differently. Uh, and then, you know, going into Toyota uh, and working on, on the factory floor, it's probably some of the, the most uh, rewarding experiences of, of my life. You know, working in operations on the floor is is really uh, satisfying because a lot of us today in our jobs, you know, that where we work at a desk, you know, it's, you know, we're doing projects and it takes a long time. But as a production worker, every day you can look at what you achieved and you, you go home and you feel like, man, I, I, I built 500 cars today or I put 500 bumpers on, on the car today or whatever it is, you can you can tangibly see. And, you know, that's something that I hope my career story uh, really helps, you know, some to inspire some young people to get into manufacturing, 
because it, it's just so important. Uh, and I learned a lot of discipline uh, at Toyota. I started there when I was 19 years old. And, um, uh, you know, uh, it was a great opportunity. Uh, at that time, there were, you know, a lot of uh, Japanese management that were here uh, that were doing a lot of the training. And again, you know, I just took advantage of every opportunity, uh, you know, that was there. I volunteered for every hour of overtime. I, you know, tried to take advantage of all of the, the opportunities that Toyota provided us. Um, and, you know, started getting promoted throughout the organization and, you know, became a, a team leader, uh, you know, where I had responsibility for, you know, for five people or six people on, on a shift. And then, you know, uh, then got promoted to be a, you know, a group leader where I had responsible for 30 or 40 and then assistant manager where I had responsible for several hundred and, you know, and then, you know, to be kind of the, the plant manager for assembly where, you know, it was several thousand and, you know, starts going, you know, up from, from there throughout my career. And along the way, Toyota developed a, a program where you could get your education while you work there. And so I took that opportunity. Um, originally in school, I was, I was planning to go into more uh, kind of engineering focused. Uh, but then as I uh, started becoming more involved in management, I ended up getting my degree in business management. Um, and um, again, so there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, good companies like Toyota in the state where, you know, these manufacturing jobs provide opportunities, you know, for your future and you can, uh, you know, continue your education and you can, you can still achieve all those things. Um, and so it was great. I had an 18 year career there. Um, at the end of my career, I moved my family over to the United Kingdom uh, um, to run uh, Toyota's um, operations there. Um, and, um, uh, you know, my kids were 13, 11, nine, and six at the time. Mm. Uh, and so it was a big move to move my family uh, over to over there. Uh, we were there for a couple of years. Uh, you know, it was a great experience. And again, you know, uh, something that, you know, a great company like Toyota provides, you know, that opportunity for, you know, somebody, you know, who grew up in, you know, I guess I should have started this. I grew up in, uh, you know, moved uh, to Kentucky uh, my freshman year of high school. Um, and um, moved from uh, just outside in the suburb of, of Tennessee, Hendersonville, Tennessee, uh, to Jamestown, Kentucky. And if you know those two locations, like they can't be any more different. So like, you know, Hendersonville's, you know, you know, uh, just on the outskirts of Nashville and, and, you know, has all of the kind of modern, uh, you know, um, amenities. Uh, we moved to Jamestown, Kentucky and, you um, there was only one restaurant in town. It was called the Omega Moo. Um, and so um, there was a population of 900 people. Uh, and so, you know, really, really small town. Uh, but, you know, to be able to do that, to be able to come from a small town uh, and, you know, and, and uh, you know, drop out of school and then go to a company like Toyota, you know, we're very fortunate to have, you know, employers like that in the state. There's several large employers in the state that provide a lot of opportunities for people here in the state. And, you know, I, I attribute a lot of my success to a lot of the people at Toyota that I had the opportunity to work with and, and the training that I received there, uh, you know, ended up being, you know, really uh, good for me. Um, and then as, uh, you know, I uh, was uh, beginning to, you know, uh, look at returning from the United Kingdom back to Toyota, I started getting some other, you know, job offers as you, you know, you, you usually do it uh, in your career. Um, and, um, you know, I had, a, I had an opportunity, uh, I was being recruited by Volkswagen Group to be the president of North and South America. Uh, and at the same time, I was recruited by this small private equity firm that was, uh, that was a spin out of KPS uh, that had just raised a really small fund. And so I was, you know, it was like, you know, one was like a dream job from an automotive perspective. And the other was something really entrepreneurial and different. And, um, you know, I, I really chose to make the change and get into private equity because, you know, I had worked in a corporation for 18 years and, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging to work in a big company too. And there's a lot of benefits to it. There's a lot of organization, but there's also a lot of constraints. It's really hard in a big company to make massive change and, and to do things quickly. Um, and so a little bit, I felt kind of, you know, restrained at, at Toyota a little bit. And so I was eager to kind of, 
move into to private equity. I'd never been to New York City uh, when I interviewed uh, with this firm in New York. Um, and I didn't really know a lot about private equity. So I ended up doing a lot of research and I ended up joining their firm as an operating professional um, in uh, 2007. And, um, and then in 2007, uh, you know, uh, uh, moved my family back to the States uh, and, you know, started working with them as they deployed their first fund. And, uh, you know, I, I won't talk about their fund performance because I'm not allowed to do that. Uh, but, you know, the, um, we had a lot of learning uh, as, the, you know, early on, it was a young uh, company. Um, and then we went out in uh, 2010 and we raised a second fund. Um, and, the, you know, the second fund was much better received, uh, you know, than, than, and had, uh, you know, some better um, overall uh, uh, results. Uh, than the first fund. And, um, uh, you know, we had changed and adapted our operating style, uh, our, our uh, acquisition style to be more operationally focused. And uh, so we started building the team out. And, and that included a lot of former Toyota folks. And we opened an office here in, in uh, first in Georgetown and then in Lexington, uh, where we had a, a team of resources uh, here that were really managing the entire portfolio. Um, and so, um, you know, as that uh, you know, I was there for almost 10 years. Uh, you know, as I was already mentioned, I kind of did the same thing there. I started kind of on the ground floor, started operationally, which if you know anything about private equity is not really involved in the transactions. And then, you know, started getting more involved in, in the transactional side of things, got promoted to managing director, started leading and doing deals myself, uh, was promoted to partner in the firm as they raised their third fund. And, you know, the story in private equity is, is that, you know, uh, a lot of firms, you know, when people first start out, people don't want to give them a lot of money. So they end up with, you know, kind of sub $500 million funds. And, and so everybody, you know, is really kind of focused on, you know, deals where they're writing, you know, kind of 10 to $20 million equity checks, which puts them in the lower middle market, uh, you know, whatever their strategy is. And so big, big firms today, like, uh, you know, KPS, uh, you know, Sun Capital Partners, Platinum Group, Gore's, you know, all of these groups all were in, the, when I started, were all lower middle market investors. And now they're all like multi-billion dollar fund sizes. And so, you know, that seems to be the trend in private equity as, you know, uh, GPs or, or managers have success. They start raising larger and larger pools of capital. They start, you know, expanding their, um, uh, in raising different pools of capital to invest in different strategies like real estate and, um, and uh, debt and those types of things. Um, and that's what, you know, we were on that path at our prior firm. Um, and uh, what, but that, what that meant is uh, we were leaving kind of the lower middle market space, you know, doing bigger deals. And, you know, I, I was at a really big company, but for 10 years, I had done a lot of investment with these smaller comp businesses and just felt like that there was a lot of opportunity, especially on the industrial space. So, you know, when at my prior firm, we started more industrial and then we moved to be more of a generalist where we were doing consumer deals, we were doing retail and, you know, my background, I'm not, you know, I don't have a retail background. I don't have a consumer background. My background is manufacturing operations. And so... Uh, after I got promoted to partner, me and uh, a couple of other people there started, you know, thinking about a different strategy where we could, you know, focus uh, purely on industrial businesses uh, and stay focused on the lower middle market. And, uh, and so as we started to develop that thought process, you know, that really became the genesis of middle ground. Uh, and I ended up leaving um, Monomoy in October of 2017 with my two partners, Lauren Mohol and Scott Duncan. Uh, Scott, uh, as was already mentioned, worked with me at Toyota. Uh, Scott's uh, originally from Georgetown, Kentucky. Uh, he, he actually started working for us at, at Toyota for $5 an hour as a co-op uh, in our um, uh, engineering department. And then he got a Toyota fellowship to attend the University of Kentucky. Uh, and he attended University of Kentucky. And, uh, and Scott and I were almost immediately paired up uh, you know, and uh, worked together our whole careers there. And so Scott was there a total of 13 years and I was there a total of 18. And, um, and then when I moved into uh, private equity, I brought Scott over with me. He was one of the Toyota people I brought on board. 
Uh, and so Scott and I've worked together for, for a really long time. And, uh, you know, as we were starting to think about the story of middle ground, you know, you have to think about, okay, now you first, you got to have come up with a name. That's like, you know, if you're, you're going to start your own firm, you got to come up with a name. And if you look at like private equity and hedge funds, like all the Greek and Roman gods are already spoken <laughs> for, you know, so you got to kind of come up with something that makes it your own. And so I, I like to fish in the Gulf of Mexico and there's this spot out in the, in the Gulf. It's about a hundred miles out. It's called the Florida middle grounds. It's an old ancient reef system. Um, but if I, if you've ever done like deep sea fishing, you know, if you go a hundred miles offshore, you, you better know what you're doing, right? Because it, a, it costs a lot of money to go out that far. And if you can't find fish when you're a hundred miles out, you know, uh, it's going to be really frustrating for everybody. Uh, the safety of everybody on board is like super important. Uh, when you're out that far, you got to know about the weather conditions and you got to, you know, all, there's a lot of things that you need to kind of master. And so as we, I was thinking about that, uh, I thought what a great kind of name for, you know, the new firm middle ground capital, because the same is true as you look at buying industrial businesses that are in the lower middle market. You know, you, you want to be partnered with the right person. And what better person to be partnered with than somebody that literally has held every job from an operational standpoint, uh, from an hourly line worker all the way into general management. And so that, that became kind of the genesis, you know, of the name um, uh, for Middle Ground. And, and you know, we kind of, uh, tried to, you know, uh, you know, make that meaning come to life as, as a part of our strategy. Um, and so we started, we had, you know, we were under, you know, pretty rigorous non-compete agreements as a lot of people in private equity are. So we, we couldn't raise money from, uh, any of our prior firms, investors, uh, you know, we could, we didn't have any track record. So we didn't take any attribution when we left the firm. Uh, we relied solely on the management teams of, companies that we had sold to be references for us. Uh, and some of the investors from our pri previous firm, even though we couldn't solicit them for investment, they offered to uh, help us with the fundraise uh, and be references, which was great. And so we, um, uh, you know, we, we went through our non-compete period and we start raising the fund uh, in um, October of 2018. Uh, in December, we had a first close on our fund and then in uh, August of 2019, we closed the fund and we were oversubscribed at about $460 million. Mm. Um, during that time, you know, we had to decide where to locate. And, um, you know, we knew that we needed a New York presence. Our, our partner, Lauren Moholan, she lives in New York. Um, but I really wanted this firm to have a stamp of Kentucky on it. I thought it was really important. I wanted to bring that opportunity to the state. To, you know, there are some smaller PE players, you know, in the state, the state that are focused, you know, on maybe some of the horse industry or things like that, some family offices, but not really a industrial private equity firm of scale. And so, you know, as Scott and I thought about it and Lauren, we, we wanted Kentucky to be the headquarters. We wanted Lexington to be the headquarters for the operation. Um, we felt like Lexington brought a lot, uh, you know, uh, we have a you know a little small airports in Kentucky and Lexington and 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 uh, Louisville and and you know Cincinnati's not what it used to be, but between those three airports, you can actually get everywhere. And you know if you live in this state, you know that you know you can get direct flights almost anywhere. Uh, and it's so it's a very efficient you know place to live. And a lot of our portfolio because we're buying manufacturing type companies are in the Midwest, so we can drive to a lot of the locations as well. So it it's actually you know just a great location. Um, it's a beautiful place to live. You know, you have all four seasons and, you know, so, and, so, and you have the universities. And so, you know, we, we decided on Lexington as our headquarters, and then we opened a satellite office uh, in New York. Um, and at first we, we had to use the New York office to really attract talent uh, into on the transaction team side, but I'm pleased to say now, uh, you know, just a few years in, we're actually, uh, uh, had someone because of COVID that decided they didn't want to move back to New York and they actually moved to Lexington. So one of our uh, deal leads, uh, Ryan McComb on the transaction side is located to Lexington. And uh, we're starting now to build out our investment team here in Lexington. So we will have, you know, kind of uh, full kind of capabilities here. Um, and we're excited about that because it's, it's really a whole new uh, kind of career opportunity for folks. 
Uh, kids that go to school here traditionally have to go out of state to get um, a um, um, internship or, or a job opportunity. And so we partnered with the University of Kentucky uh, on uh, you know, having a very active program for interns. Um, as, as many of you guys know that are in the industry, you know, being able to have that you intern at a private equity firm gives you a little leg up when you're going to get a job at an investment bank or you know, at, at, a, at an accounting firm or wherever you're going. Uh, and so, you know, we've been able to have, uh, you know, several people that have already interned for us that have gone on and, and, and taking careers in the industry. So we're, we're excited to kind of give back that and provide those opportunities. Uh, but we raised the first fund. Uh, we've, we've done, uh, this month, we're closing on our seventh platform which uh, is Shiloh Industries is a public company that was going through bankrupt. Um, and, um, uh, but uh, we've, we've basically deployed already about 70% of the fund. Uh, we've been very active throughout COVID. You know, uh, that's another thing about Kentucky. Uh, most of the private equity firms in New York aren't even back in the office yet. And so we've been able to be back in the office in Lexington since May. So we've been open for business. We've been doing diligence. You know, we've been doing, you know, all, you know, all the things that we need and, and we've been able to close, you know, this will be our fourth transaction and it'll be about $360 million that we put to work, uh, you know, since March of this year uh, with COVID, you know, in play. So, you know, we've, um, uh, you know, we're pretty happy with how, you know, we've been able to perform during this period. Uh, this has been a lot of opportunity. We've grown the firm from three of us. There's now 28 professionals at Middle Ground. Uh, with the majority of those being people that, you know, are earning, you know, six figures in the state of Kentucky. And so, you know, uh, you know, I think it's important, uh, you know, to be able to do that uh, for the local economy here and to be able to continue to grow. And so uh, now we're at a kind of an inflection point where we um, are starting to raise our second fund uh, at the beginning of the year. We'll be kicking that off in earnest. Um, and uh, we're also raising an over, uh, overflow fund for uh, both fund one and fund two with a specific fo focus on in making investments in the automotive kind of slash mobility industries. Um, we're seeing a lot of opportunity. Uh, you know, we're lower middle market investors, you know, and that we kind of do less than $300 million of EV. And we bought two very large companies because of the situation uh, in, in kind of the COVID environment. Uh, with uh, we bought Dura Automotive, we bought 75% of Dura in August. It's about an $800 million revenue business. You know, doing you know uh, you know about 55 you know million dollars of EBITDA, um, which would seem a very big business for a fund like us to buy. But because of the dynamics of COVID, you know, we were able to execute that transaction. And then Shiloh, uh, you know, which we just purchased for $218 million, um, and um, uh, which again is, is, is about a billion dollar uh, revenue business, uh, you know, with, you know, a little north of, you know, kind of $65 million of EBITDA. So, uh, you know, we're, we're really excited about that. And, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the story uh, and, you know, how we, you know, started doing what we're doing and, you know, happy to kind of answering questions. John, a, a question, maybe the investments you all are making both, both platform and, and, uh, and add on activity. Uh, I know, I know Dura and Shiloh, you said, are, are, are a little larger than you typically make, but what, what, what are the sweet spots um, for, for platform additions and then, and then maybe even just some tuck-in activity? Sure. So, you know, so we, we only do industrial B2B and specialty distribution uh, headquartered in North America. So, you know, we don't do any consumer. We try to stay away from industrial businesses that have uh, in-market exposure to retail. We try to limit that to no more than kind of 25%. We like the companies that are, you know, making a product and selling it, you know, to, to another person that's actually making, you know, the, the final, you know, uh, the final products. Uh, we like being in that part of the, of the food chain. Um, you know, typically, you know, as I said, we're, we're kind of looking for deals, you know, up to $300 million of EV uh, enterprise value. Um, we, um, um, you know, kind of, for a platform, we're looking between 15 and, you know, 15 and 50 million of EBITDA, you know, 15 is kind of the low end for us. 
Uh, Add-on acquisitions can be, you know, uh, you know, if they're strategic, they can be a, you know, a small, you know, it can be $5 million revenue and a million and a half of EBITDA, you know, if it's, uh, if it's, you know, for, uh, for uh, add-ons and, and we're very active in that space. Uh, we did one add-on acquisition for our platform Alco in August of this year. Um, and then we're doing another one right now. Uh, we have a, um, uh, we have a business we own called Edsco fasteners. And what they do is they make foundation bolt cages for power and transmission uh, uh, lines. So when you see the big steel monopoles coming out of the ground and you see like the bolts that look like they're coming out of, out of the ground that bolt the pole down, that's what we make. And those structures are really fascinating because you know they're made out of rebar and they can be up to 15 feet in diameter and almost 60 feet long. Mm -hmm. And then they go down in the ground that 60 feet, you pour the concrete around it and then all you're left with is what looks like bolt heads sticking out. And then you put the monopole on it and you tighten it down and you know that's that's how that's done. So we bought that business in uh, in January of of 2020, and the company is a really good cash flowing business. Uh, you know that was doing about 15 million dollars of EBITDA. You know, and even during COVID, you know, in the first kind of nine months we owned the business, they already paid down more than 30 percent of their debt. So mm -hmm. you know it's a you know really really good uh, cash flowing business. That's something else we like to see. But we're doing an add-on acquisition for it right now is why I mentioned it. Uh, we're buying a steel uh, business that actually make, they make steel I-beams, um, galvanized I-beams, uh, but they, um, they're specifically uh, used uh, in the end market for solar installation. And so this, this platform that we have with Edsco in this new business is really focused on industrial businesses that have exposure to infrastructure investing uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, there's a lot of uh, money that needs to be spent on our infrastructure. Uh, and especially uh, when you look at grid hardening and, and solar power, solar uh, is really gaining a lot of momentum. It's an industry that's seeing kind of, a, you know, 20 plus percent uh, Kager. Uh, and so it's an exciting opportunity to, to be able to do that. We spend a lot of time doing a lot of research understanding a lot of different end markets and then understanding the industrial component to it and how we can, you know, invest in that area. So it's, uh, we're not real, not, we're not so much opportunistic that we just look at whatever, you know, the investment banks are bringing us through the door. Of course, you know, we look at those items, but we, we are more strategic. And so we have a thesis around infrastructure. And then we also have one around mobility because of my roots in automotive and, you mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, you know, in my team, we have, you know, eight members of our team that have automotive experience as well. You know, we're, we think we're positioned probably better than most other PE firms to really understand, you know, the industry. And, it, and it's really fascinating because um, the changes that are going on in the automotive industry with, you know, electrification of the powertrain, connected car, autonomous driving, uh, mm -hmm. vehicle lightweighting, all these different things that are driving kind of the change of an automotive industry into more of a mobility industry mm -hmm. have really scared and rattled a lot of investors. Um, you know, when you look at um, the, the automotive industry, um, investments have been down significantly, um, you know, from 2018 to 2019, you know, deal value uh, dropped by 21% and, you know, deal volume dropped by 18%. Uh, and then in the first part of this year, from 2019 to 2020, deal value dropped by a staggering 55%. And again, you know, deal volume was, of course, down substantially as well. And, you know, the phenomenon that's going on is a lot of financial sponsors don't really understand the changes that are, that are happening in the supply base and who are going to be the ultimate winners and losers. Um, and, you know, a business that we owned, we owned a stamping business that made uh, um, uh, components for transmissions at my prior firm, we did very well on that transaction. We, we had really good returns. Uh, and that same business was in the market again for sale this year. And the banker, of course, came to me and he said, hey, you used to own this business. Don't you want to buy it? I was like, nope. Uh, and, you know, we didn't even bid on it. And, and he was like, well, why don't you want to buy it? And I'm like, well, 95% of the products are transmissions. And you know, hybrid and electric vehicles don't have transmissions, you know, 
Uh, and mm. so, you know, that's not a long-term space in, in, in the market. Now, 20 years from now, are there still going to be transmissions made? Yes. And will somebody make a lot of money by being the last guy to make transmissions? Yes. But that's not going to be me. That's not our investment strategy. Yeah. So we're really trying to focus on those four trends, uh, the electrification. You know, we bought Dura Automotive. The reason we did is Dura had won a program with uh, Daimler to make uh, all of their battery trays for their electric and hybrid vehicles uh, in Europe and in North America. Um, and in order to do that, we have to invest about $180 million to build four facilities, three in Europe and one in Alabama. Um, but, but again, they're uh, along the, they support the electrification of the powertrain. And so that's an area that's going to grow dramatically, you know, over the next five years, you're going to see a complete difference. You know, you're already seeing it today and it's kind of subtle. A lot of people don't realize it, but like the F-150, which has been the best selling car for the last 30 years in the U S you know, is now the standard engine is a six cylinder hybrid. So, you know, that technology is starting to go th all throughout. And within five years, you know, you're going to see the vast majority of cars are going to be hybrid or, or, you know, have that kind of technology. They'll still have some internal combustion engine component. And then a really large portion, uh, about 25% uh, over the next five years are going to be purely electric. And, um, you know, even Porsche, you know, just came out with the Taycan, uh, which is an all electric uh, Porsche. And um, um, uh, the, uh, it's the best selling car for Porsche right now, yeah. you know, and, and again, it's, it's, it's really uh, uh, fun to be uh, investing along those strategies and, and, you know, and that, so that's what we're doing in automotive right now is we're trying to invest along those four key strategies. Um, you know, even though we know automotive well, you know, we, um, we did a couple things. We, um, we hired a research group and we spent about nine or 12 months dissecting the whole supply chain based on who had exposure to these trends, who we thought were going to be the winners, who we thought were going to be the losers, um, and uh, where we wanted to invest. Uh, and then what we did is we assembled a panel of experts uh, that are in the automotive today. So I haven't been in the industry for 13 years and, you know, I, I don't consider myself an expert on these trends. Uh, but what we did is we brought in people that were. So we've got a, a group of, um, we call them our advisory board. And it's like a who's who in the industry today, uh, you know, that has, um, you know, all kind of, uh, of, of really, uh, you know, good individuals, you know, that are helping us, uh, you know, to make these decisions. And they're, they're executives, you know, in the electric car space, uh, you know, exec, you know, uh, CEOs for, you know, uh, European OEMs and a lot of, a lot of different uh, individuals. But so when, before we make these investments, we're kind of bouncing those ideas off of these people. How do they align with our trends? What do we think like the growth trajectory looks like? Uh, and so it's really exciting. And, and so I mentioned we're raising an overflow fund uh, to focus on this. Uh, and the reason that we're doing that is because we're a small fund at $460 million, uh, we do have a very active co-investment program with all of our investors. Um, and so, um, we're able to write bigger checks. You know, I told you we'd, we'd put over, you know, uh, you know, over $300 million work this year. Uh, you know, probably a hundred of that's come out of the fund and the rest has been through co-investment and, uh, uh, you know, uh, through co-investment. Um, but, uh, we, you know, we see the opportunity to, to really make more investments on automotive and I don't want to over-concentrate my fund from an in-market perspective. So what we're doing is, is, um, both Shiloh and Dura, you know, the, the equity check sizes were big, you know, they were big equity checks, but we're only keeping about $30 million of each in the fund. Uh, and then we'll put the rest in this overage fund. Uh, that's where, where, where investors that, uh, you know, um, want to take advantage of the disruption that's going on in the industry. Uh, and they want to invest with people that have the knowledge to kind of navigate that. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, a lot of investors today are really frustrated because they feel like they missed out on the rebound in the public markets of what happened with COVID. Mm -hmm. and, mm. and that's the good thing about private market investing is there's a lag. So even though the public markets have recovered, you know, uh, there's a lot of challenge on, the, on private market businesses. And so uh, the same for the automotive industry. So you know, there's also a, a, a value component to it 
where, you know, you can invest in, in companies like Dura and Shiloh, you know, where arguably we paid, you know, uh, uh, you know, pennies on the dollar to what these, these business would have sold for in a healthy environment. Mm. Um, and, and, um, but again, uh, it, we're not buying any asset in automotive. They have to have alignment with, you know, technology and booked business that they've already won with customers, you know, in their uh, future uh, that align with those one of one of those four trends. Yeah, John had a couple of questions come through. Um, one, I think you already kind of talked about there uh, in when you're looking at acquisitions, especially in automotive future and advanced technologies, um, uh, in, in what you're looking for. I think I think probably what you were talking about there hit a lot of that one. But another one came through about when going into an acquisition, uh, areas, departments you focus on to make improvement um, or change to, to kind of impact your goals, drive drive bottom line growth. Yeah, you know, so so as, as, you know, as former Toyota people, you would expect, you know, we have like processes and systems for everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, um, what we've done is in the, in the, you know, 13 years now, is that right? Yeah. 13 years I've been doing this. It's crazy. <laughs> um, and, uh, we, you know, Scott and I have kept like a lot of data, uh, you know, on, on businesses that we've seen businesses that we've looked at, you know, businesses that we've owned, what we've been able to accomplish. And so, you know, we, we kind of separate when we first start out, we separate, um, you know, our, uh, what we call our value creation plan into like two big buckets. One is cash generation uh, opportunities, improving free cash flow generation uh, and one-time cash generation. And then um, the second one is cost reduction. And so that's one thing about our strategy. So a lot of, a lot of PE firms uh, rely heavily on leverage, you know, to do their deals, you know, that's LBO and uh, the L and LBO. And um and then, you know, they, they'll they underwrite. And we, we probably all underwrite to, you know, similar, you know, returns over a five-year period of time. But the difference between middle ground is because we have our operating team and we have such a deep background in these items uh, and we've had such a, you know, track record of successfully executing these things at, at Toyota and other places, um, we underwrite that about 35 to 50% or more of the equity value that's created under our ownership comes from the things that our team can execute and improve at the business, which gives us a competitive edge when we're, you know, against someone like a plain vanilla PE buyer. Um, and what that also does, it lets us not rely heavily on leverage. So typically I put 45 to hundred percent equity in the deals that I do. In COVID right now, I'm I'm it, it's north of 65 percent because I don't want to over leverage the business. Um, and uh, you know, so one rule of investing I've learned in 13 years: don't ever be in a situation where a third party is going to tell you what you have to do to manage your business, and you won't end up with a zero, <laughs> right? And so you know that's that's the most important thing is not have the zeros, uh, you know, and um, but going back to the VCP, we look at we look at everything in working capital. Uh, you know, we look at pay, uh, payment terms, inventory management. We look at receivable management. We look at capex spending, uh, and that's where having engineers like Scott on our team are really good, because you know if you're a financial firm and the CEO of a very technical business tells you he needs a capex project for twenty million dollars, who are you to tell him no? Scott's a degreed mechanical engineer that, you know, worked 13 years doing the same type of work. He can go in there and say, you don't need $20 million. You can do this with $7 million or, you know, something like that. So mm -hmm. it gives us that kind of firsthand knowledge and it gives us credibility with our management teams. And then on the cost side, we look at every line item of the P&L. So everything we look at, you know, the costs uh, for uh, components, of course, labor, you know, uh, efficiency improvements, uh, and, and those types of activities that we do. Um, and, you know, currently in the current environment where unemployment is pretty low, uh, it, it's, it's a good environment to be make uh, things more efficient because it's a challenge to hire new people. And usually we're not having to lay people off unless we, you know, unfortunately we have to like a close a plant because it's, you know, it doesn't have enough volume or something. But um, typically we're able to use like natural attrition to kind of, you know, take over you know, as, as we make efficiency improvements. So 
but we those are the buckets that we look at and we we underwrite those in very deep in a in a real detailed way uh and it goes into a part of our underwriting and we call that our secret sauce that's what makes us different uh than everybody else uh there are things that we can control no matter what the what the economy is or what the in market what happens in the in market uh and um and we focus on those some things that i would just give some advice to people if they're if you're a small business owner out there today <clears throat> check like your ap and ar processes just do like a check of it because we bought a family business one time and it was a big business 200 million dollars of revenue we generated we 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 did a 15 million dollar dividend three months into owning the company just by having the accounts payable group start paying their bills on time <laughs> and that what they would do is they would take the bills as soon as they came in and pay them even though the vendor gave them 30 or 45 day terms i mean we didn't go even ask for new terms we just said stop paying the bills early we we hmm. paid back 15 million dollars you know i mean and the the ceo of the company was the family member who we bought it from and he came to me and said i feel like an idiot you know <laughs> And, uh, you know, I said, well, you're a shareholder now, so you get part of the 15 million. He goes, yeah, but if I would have done it before you got here, I would have got all the 15 million. I'm like, well, yeah, that's true. So there's, there's like some low hanging fruit we see every time. Something that every manufacturing business could do better at is making sure that you have the a right amount of labor for your sales, you know, and, and having some kind of system for that. And we have we have a labor planning tool that I would gladly send anybody uh, that we use. It's uh, something we adopted from Toyota um, where, you know, you can take your earned hours and your sales and you can put it in and it tells you what you need to do with your labor, uh, you know, and, and you can factor in temporary labor and absenteeism and all that into it. True story. We, we say five to 10% labor efficiency just by putting that in at our companies, mm. just by getting that put in place and having people, be disciplined, um, you know, when they're doing their budget to look at their labor and, you know, and, and, and because if you don't have something like that, you default to having too much labor. And so, you know, there's some low hanging fruits out there and, you know, we'd be happy to, like I said, anybody wants to email me directly, I'd be happy to share that with you. It's no, it's not my proprietary secret. I learned it while I was at Toyota, but again, we adopted it for small companies. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's, it, you know, some of the low hanging fruit that we see out there. Well, John, that, that segues well, um, talking about your internal team, uh, Tony Thompson sent through a question, um, just asking what, what's the, the, the dynamic like today when you're looking to add talent to your own internal team, um, wh where are you seeing the talent pools and, and kind of who are you competing for, um, for those individuals? Yeah. You know, unfortunately for Toyota, we hired a bunch of three people. Uh, so I don't know that Susan out there is like a real a middle ground supporter right now. Um, but, uh, you know, again, we go to that because we're like based here in Lexington and they're, they're kind of a premier, you know, manufacturer and, and we're buying industrial companies. Uh, but, you know, we, we have people with uh, on the operating side that have come to us from, uh, you know, Ford and, and, and other, you know, operational businesses. Um, we are hiring right now. We're looking for people on the operating side as we're continuing to grow and expand. Uh, so if there's, you know, if you know people that are interested, uh, we're hiring. My partner, Scott Duncan, is, is, is handling now all of that. If you can email him at sduncan at middlegroundcapital.com, uh, you know, anybody that has a resume or anybody that's interested. We're looking for people of all skill sets, people that have manufacturing finance backgrounds as well. We're hiring some analysts uh, right now looking for people, you know, uh, directly out of college or uh, with some accounting experience that are looking to, to get in the, an opportunity to get into private equity. Um, and, and we do provide the opportunity to come in on the operating side, move over to the transaction side. So we had a analyst that started with us named Tyler May started as an analyst on the ops team. He just got promoted and now he's an associate on the transaction team. So, you know, that we're providing some, you know, good opportunity. Uh, we, we have, we try to have the best culture, uh, and we try to have, we try to treat our employees the best. In fact, you know, we actually won, you know, the, uh, the award for uh, best employer in the state of Kentucky, less than 150 employees in our first year. Uh, and we're proud of that because it was a survey that was done by the Chamber of Commerce with our employees. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, you pay people well, that's all great. But we also try to take care of everything else. We try to take, make sure that, you know, uh, being a small business, you have some advantages over larger companies. Like I can't offer the benefit plans that Toyota has. 
just can't do it. I, you know, I don't have access to that, but I can do other things. So like we, we do some things. We, we just hired a chef in Lexington. And so we have um, a chef that prepares meals, uh, but also uh, prepares dinners for people. And all we ask the employees to pay for is the uh, food. And if you think about that, it's, it's a great perk for your employees, uh, you know, to be able to do that. Um, we have people's cars washed for them once a month, uh, you know, detailed. It's nice to go to work. You know, it doesn't cost us a lot of money to do that. You know, it costs us about $300 a month, but it's a nice little perk to do for people. And there's nothing great than greater than dropping off a dirty car. And when you go home, you got a clean car. So, you know, small things, you know, can make a difference. Uh, and because we're in Kentucky, you know, look, if we were in New York and we tried to hire like a corporate chef, I mean, it'd be ridiculous. You know, here, you know, we've been able to use the opportunity and, you know, it's very inexpensive. Um, and, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, it's cheaper than just ordering food out and, uh, and, and plus mm. it's a better, and we were able to offer, you know, that to our employers, employees. So we're always looking for, you know, things like that. Um, in Kentucky right now, we're looking for a new headquarters, new home. Um, We've been trying to uh, to acquire the uh, old World Equestrian headquarters out at the horse park. Um, uh, the World Equestrian, they build a new headquarters. If there's anybody from the Kentucky like tourism board on here, we need your approval. We've been waiting like four months for it. So, you know, if you guys would uh, move that forward, we'd really appreciate it because we're bursting <laughs> at the themes here in the Chase building. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a big deal because we're the first non-equestrian business to look at going out at the horse park. Um, and so, um, but, uh, they're, they're eager to get us out there. The building's been vacant for almost three years. Uh, and you know, we think it'd be a great location, a great way to showcase the state to investors that come in, uh, to be out at the horse park and kind of show that part of our culture, uh, in the industry here in Kentucky. Um, so we're hoping that that goes through, but that's, you know, that's a little bit about, you know, how we, uh, you know, go about bringing in talent and retaining them. Okay, perfect. Uh, another one, I guess this one's kind of tangential um, to internal versus external resources. A question came through on, you know, clearly you have a lot of internal expertise when you're when you're looking at either potential acquisitions or improvements to existing companies. But are are, are there other resources you use, um, you know, whether that's groups or or firms um, to to assist in some of that those pieces? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we you know we we have to. I mean. Uh, you know, uh, our portfolio now, you know, 20 plus thousand people, you know, worldwide plants all over the place. So it's really hard for our, our operating team to manage all of that and be a part of that uh, on a daily basis. So we do, we leverage a lot of it, a lot of, uh, of our former people that we know, uh, some of them, you know, our groups here in the state, uh, we tend to use more smaller boutique groups uh, just because, uh, you know, we like being like the majority of their business because it just helps us, you know, um, move at the pace that we want to. Uh, and so we get to know them really well uh, and, and are able to do that. But we, we use some larger groups as well. Um, you know, we're using Conway McKenzie for a project today, you know, on the buy side where, you know, we, we use BKD and, and uh, you know, other um, accounting firms, you know, Cone Resnick and Grant Thornton and, you know, more kind of the, you know, level two, level three groups, you know, versus the big four uh, is more appropriate for the types of companies that we acquire. Uh, and so we're, we do a lot of that. We do a lot of that work. Uh, sorry, you got the office dog in the background, <laughs> Sophie. Um, but um, yeah, so we, we use a lot of uh, uh, third parties to help us with a lot of things. We don't use a lot of third parties to help us. Like, you know, there's people all the time saying, hey, we'll come in and do your operational diligence. I don't, I don't need that. And I wouldn't trust it you know, just because we have that internally and it's a kind of our secret sauce. Um, but we do use specific groups. Like we use people to help us with, you know, like freight savings and we use people to help us with, you know, um, uh, supply chain, uh, you know, opportunities or, or IT or specific things like that. But the pure kind of lean manufacturing efficiency, we do all in house. Um, another question came through. This is a little change of pace. Um, someone had asked how you all are preparing for a change in political administrations and anything you're changing strategy wise at this point? No, I mean, look, I mean, uh, you know, Toyota was a great place to work and Toyota taught, taught us some things. One of the things that they did in kind of our executive training is, you know, whenever there's a, whenever there's change or there's a crisis or whatever, you know, you want to think about, you need to, you know, the bigger the change, 
the longer term your view needs to be on what the potential outcomes are. Mm -hmm. So like when COVID hit, it was kind of controversial at the time, but you know, we, um, we were one of the first to announce that we would pay people, you know, if they had to take off for COVID back in early March. But we also, I, I, I don't know of any other PE firm that did this. If there are others, great. But we made the announcement and we didn't have any mandatory layoffs at any of our companies because of COVID. And that was because we thought the rebound was going to be quick. And, and, and so again, from that Toyota training, you know, we kind of came together and we made the decision that the right thing to do, this was unprecedented what had happened in the country, was to not abandon our employees and put them on, you know, unemployment, uh, but, but to, you know, provide work in that stability for them. And we did that. And uh, uh, it really paid off for us because the ramp up in the third quarter was really strong. And we were able to capture that because our people weren't, you know, collecting unemployment checks that were bigger than their, their other checks. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, as, as the, we look at the administration, I kind of look at it the same way, you know, look, if, if, if Biden, uh, if, if that group, uh, that administration decides to change, you know, the tax policy for private equity, I don't care. I can't, I can't, I can't care about that because I can't control it. Uh, and so we, we have to manage our businesses. Uh, the last administration was very helpful to manufacturing in North America. You know, whether you liked uh, the president or not, that's not really the issue. Some of those tactics really help North American manufacturing jobs. Uh, you know, some of the protectionism, you know, with, with especially with China, uh, really helped shore up. And there's a lot of reshoring going on. Actually, that's what I spoke about at ACG yesterday. Um, and it really helped. I hope the new administration doesn't just like want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that everything the old administration doing was wrong. Uh, you know, and I don't think any administration should do that. I think that, you know, hopefully, you know, they're experienced enough that they'll go in, they'll look at the things that were actually benefiting our country, uh, benefit, benefiting manufacturing jobs in our country. Uh, and those things hopefully will continue. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you know, let them, let them make the changes that, that they will. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the uh, risk and the opportunity of living in a great country like America. Mm -hmm. yeah, I appreciate that. Um, Another one came through. I know. I know you spoke a little bit on on fund two, um, do, and and maybe starting that the, the the beginning of next year. Do you have an idea of what what target size is on that? Yeah, I apologize too. My my uh, clock that Toyota gave me when I left. Uh, that's like the parting gift they usually give people is chiming in the background. I should have turned <laughs> that off, but you're going to hear twelve chimes. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, as I told you, you know, we want to stay focused on the lower middle market. So we raised $460 million, which is a nice first size fund. Yep. You know, a lot of people would go out and raise, you know, 800, 900 million, billion dollars. We're not going to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't need to do that. We don't have the overhead structure where we need that much, you know, fee revenue. Um, and so we're raising a modestly larger fund. We're targeting 550 million. Okay. Uh, in fact, all three of our first funds will be under $700 million. And again, that's just to be disciplined in our approach uh, to stay focused on what we like doing. And so uh, our strategy has no change in it from fund one to fund two. We're, we're ex exactly the same strategy that we're executing right now. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, my goal in doing that is, is hoping that I have a small group of investors, kind of you know, less than 30 investors that you know, invest in my funds and they appreciate what we're doing and what we're trying to do uh, and that the most inefficient part of private equity is fundraising. Um, and so, you know, I'm trying to bring some efficiency to it by, you know, um, you know, keeping our strategy very tight, uh, creating a lot of value for our um, LPs. So, you know, one thing that we do is we don't charge any of our LPs any economics on co-investment, period. And we never will do so. There's some firms that think I'm crazy because there's a lot of economics that you're giving up in, the, in that situation. But, you know, um, we got a saying here in Kentucky, you know, pigs get fat, and hogs get slaughtered, right? So, <laughs> you know, it, you know when, it, when you've got enough, there's no reason to go in. And if you really wanna be a partner to the companies you own and to your LPs, you know, once they become your, your partners and they're already, you know, we're investing on their behalf, this isn't my money. Mm -hmm. um, I, I try to add value to them every way that I can. And, and, and if that's showing them opportunity of a way to invest their capital with no fees and no carry, 
you know, and it helps me to do incremental deals in the fund and take risk out of my portfolio construction. I view it as a win. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, 14 out of our 22 investors in fund one have participated with us. And, you know, as of when we close the Shiloh deal, there'll be about over $250 million of co-investment that's been done on a no fee and no carry basis. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's, it's, again, it's just part of that philosophy of, you know, trying to, to be value added, just like any company does. They try to become more value added their customers and they win more business with their customers. Well, that's what I want to do with my LPs. I want to create more value for them uh, than the other guys. And then when they have to make a decision, they can help me by making the fundraise process really efficient. Bill Furco had asked uh, when you were speaking about when you were at Toyota, he asked if you were there when uh, Gary Convis was there. He's a great leader. Yeah, absolutely. Gary actually, um, um, when I left, uh, Gary actually was very supportive of me leaving, leaving Toyota. Um, and because of, you know, what I wanted to do and, you know, where I was, what I was planning to do the kind of long term. And uh, Gary was on the boards of one of the first companies that we acquired uh, at my prior firm. And so Gary and I've stayed really well in touch. He was a, he was a mentor to me while I was at Toyota. Uh, and we had a very close, we have a very close relationship. And so I think, I think a lot of Gary, uh, you know, he did a lot for Toyota. A lot of people don't know it, but when Gary got there, Toyota in Georgetown was not like, you know, uh, the best run facility. And uh, Gary came in there and, and put a lot of discipline in place and, and uh, you know, and, and really, you know, did a lot of things that transformed the business and some things that were hard to do that were kind of controversial. Uh, but, you know, again, those are, that's what good leaders do. And then had success at Dana, you know, turning Dana around after he left, uh, you know, um, I would have loved to have been on that. You know, he, uh, he told me the story about when they gave him his stock options at 14 cents a share, uh, during the great re recession. And now you can, you know, see what their stocks worth. So Gary's done quite well for himself. Hmm. All right, J John, I'll give you one last one. I know, I, I, no, you're a, an author, so you want to you want to pitch your uh, your book. Oh, did you see it sitting here? Huh? Uh, I saw it's in there, so yeah. yeah, I want to give you a chance to talk. Yeah, thank on. you. Yes, <laughs> the best book on lean manufacturing that money can buy. Now, um, no, but seriously, I wrote this book. You know, it was something I worked on while I was at Toyota, uh, and actually, I got I got some resistance while I was at Toyota about writing the book. In turn, you know, they didn't want. So when I left, I that's when I published the book. Uh, but it's about my experiences there, and really. You know, one thing that I tried to do is there's a lot of people that have, if, if you've never worked at Toyota, you, you, people and a lot of these lean consultants, they talk about Toyota like it's utopia, like everything at Toyota is done perfectly. That's absolutely not the case. Otherwise, you wouldn't need an and on rope on the production line, you know, and when people would ask us, you know, how many times they get pulled? I'm like, well, about 65,000 times a day. You know, I mean, it's a lot. You know, I mean, when you look at every individual process and, you know, everywhere, um, and they're like, really? Toyota has that many problems? I'm like, no, operations has that many problems. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, you know, it's a part of the system. And so I wanted to write the book so, you know, people wouldn't be so intimidated by, you know, uh, by, by trying to get started with a lean manufacturing initiatives, because mm -hmm. it, it's not, it's not, it shouldn't be intimidating. And a lot of it's common sense and basic. And so, you know, I, I did, I, you know, I wrote that it was, you know, just something that, that I did. Uh, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's not going to win any awards or any, any great things like that, but, uh, you can't get it on Amazon, uh, you know, and, um, uh, you know, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, people find some value in that. Great. Right. Well, well, John, we, we appreciate the time today. I, I think one, we'd love to feature private equity groups that are sitting in our market and, and, and you guys are doing it well. And there's not a lot of groups, groups this size that are, that are, sitting here locally. So um, appreciate it. I appreciate the unique perspective you bring. Um, and I think it, it really is a distinguishing message and, and just your candidness on sharing um, some of the ways you operate. I uh, really appreciate it. So, um, but yeah, John, thanks again uh, for you and the, and the team in Middle Ground. Uh, should be a gift if, if you haven't received it. Um, Terry should have something coming your way uh, in ACG Yeti. So um, yeah, no, looking forward to that. Perfect. Yeah. All right.